the God who honors, the God who lifts, the God who honors, both riches and honor come from you. Koinonia, pray. If the mountain of the Lord's house must be exalted, and if all nations should flow to it, then that house must present a God that honors, a God that lifts. Hallelujah. Number five. Someone you just prayed into your next level right now. <laughs> Number five. What kind of a God must we present to the nations if we want to see the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 2 revealed? We want to see the nations flow to it. We want to see multitudes rush to Jesus. We want to see men give up mundane gods and everything and run to the God of the Bible. We must present a God who is interested in the prosperity and overall well-being of the believer. The God who is interested in the prosperity and the overall well-being of the believer. Three serious scriptures. One, Psalm 35, 27. Psalm 35, verse 27. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which had prosperity, which had, pros which had pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. 1 Corinthians 29, 11 and 12. 1 Chronicles 29, 11 and 12. Can I tell you, we are in the apostolic era of the church. There is something that God wants to do through the church. And a church that is not economically empowered. I said this the last time we met. That church is going to be weak. I submit to you and I don't want to go ahead of myself. You see, the land, the property, the property that by the privilege of God's grace, do you know, you already have an idea. These are, these are properties running to billions. And you want to be able to, you are, it takes resources to just quietly pay and not say anything and not go around manipulating people. Not, not tens of millions, not hundreds of millions, billions. It takes resources to keep you as a person of integrity. I taught you last week, if you do not have financial resources, you will steal, you will lie, you will borrow. Let's read this together. Thine, O Lord, want to go, please. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Uh huh. For all that is in heaven and earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted above all. Verse 12. He said, both riches and honor come from thee, and thou reignest above all. He says, and in thy hand is the power and the might, and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength, all kinds of strength, including financial strength. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, please hear me. I will run to a God who I'm told loves me and can forgive and, and can forgive. I will run to a God who I'm told can heal my infirmities. I will run to a God who I'm told can deliver me. I will run to a God who I'm told can honor and can lift me. And I will run to a God who I'm told is also conscious not just of his program. That would be a selfish God. A God who, in spite of the fact that he's conscious of his divine prophetic program, is also kind enough to be conscious of my needs. It is a lopsided theology to sell a God who is just pushing the saints kingdom advance, kingdom advance, let souls be won, let nations be saved. I agree, but he's kind and loving enough to see to it that whilst you serve his purposes, your needs are met. Do not exempt that out of your theology. 
Hallelujah. Psalm 23 verse 1. I have done a whole teaching. You can go and listen to it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. One more time. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The last time. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That means if you are in lack and want, it is an indictment on his leadership that he's not responsible enough to see to it that your needs are met. I will preach salvation like that is all there is to preach. I will preach transformation like that is all there is to preach. I will preach every aspect of the kingdom like that. That is all to preach. When it's time to preach wealth and abundance, I will preach it as if I do not know any other thing to preach because you must receive the whole counsel of God. Hallelujah. Psalms 34 and verse 10. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. As responsible, I have watched from not Joe Wild, the pride, you know, the whole, the way that the pride functions. And I can tell you they are quite, lions are quite responsible creatures. They ensure that their youngs as much as possible do not lack. But the Bible says as powerful as they are, they are limited. That the young lions do lack and suffer hunger. He said, but they that seek the Lord. Are there benefits there? They that seek the Lord. He didn't say they shall just be Christians who are preparing for heaven. He says they shall not want any good. We have preached a message in the body of Christ and you will hear many of my teachings that relate to what I'm saying. Total surrender. And I will keep preaching it till the day I see his face. Loving Jesus beyond things. Loving Jesus above things. I will never stop preaching it. But in addition to that, I would have lied to you as a man of God if I told you that God only calls you to serve him and forgets about your need. That is not an intelligent presentation. That lopsided presentation is the reason why people have had cause to look at our God as a selfish God. Because to the average believer, it looks like your entire spiritual pursuit is just to serve him, to love him. All your money, give to him. All your wisdom, give to him. Everything. And there is nothing for you. We don't serve God because of things, but there are things we receive as we serve God. We do not serve God just because we want all of these things, but he has so designed it as proof of his love. All that I've told you right now, ladies and gentlemen, the psalmist simply calls them his benefits. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, verse 1, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Let me show you the five things that I said now. That the church must present to the nations as touching who God is. The psalmist said we should forget not all his benefits. That means as you are blessing the Lord, bless him because you love him. But have this consciousness that serving God pays. That there are benefits to serving the Lord. Benefit number one, verse three. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. This is the God who forgives. Number two, who healeth all thy diseases. Number three, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Number four, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Finally, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like an eagle. This is the God that the end time church must present to the nations. <laughs> present this God to a businessman. He will respond the same way a poor man will respond. If he does not need the God who lives because he is already prosperous, he will soon need the God who heals. Present this to someone who may be an intellectual but bound in a family with witchcraft and you will need the God who delivers provided you are on earth you will need one of these five dimensions of God the one who loves you enough to have given his son who forgives 
the one who heals all of our diseases and infirmities, the one who delivers us from destruction, the one who crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies, bringing honors and liftings of all sorts to our lives, and then the one who satisfied your mouth. I will never serve God and beg for bread. No. I reject that theology. It will never be part of my life. It is not because begging for bread is necessarily, I don't have a problem with it. It's just that it is not the will of God and it is wrong. It is a misrepresentation of the God who called me. I don't know the one who saved you, but the one who saved me as revealed from scripture is careful and loving to see that eventually my life becomes a holistic capture of his forgiveness, his healing, his deliverance, deliverance, his lifting, and his prosperity. You present such a God to the world, and I can tell you the nations will run and come to him. Africa is the most religious continent, and Africa has been gifted by God. This is a nation that is literally sitting on eternal treasures, that even if all the dispensations from the time that the world began till now. All the minerals and everything is explored. We will not be able to exhaust it, but we're impoverished. Today, psychologists and philosophers have coined the Christian faith in addition to all other religion. I don't want to mention their names. You've studied about them in history. They have coined religion to be a source of consolation for masses and weak and beggarly people. You see, one time I had the privilege of speaking with some diplomats. They were actually U.S. diplomats and we were having a discussion. And they were asking me about my perspective as to why Africa, in spite of the fact that it is a very religious continent, it seemed to not make the kind of progress. And I said, no, the problem is not God. The first problem is we ministers of the gospel and the kind of Christianity that is being sold in Africa. On one hand, we have a Christianity that is built on materialism and just carnal comfort as the total basis for serving God. But on another hand, we have a theology that teaches a false dimension of holiness, extracting these other dimensions of God's benefit. Both of them are stretches of imbalance. You cannot mentor a people and build a theology that is based on carnality and materialism. Can I tell you, if God never gives me any of these things, I still love him and I will serve him all my life. You see that now? Yes. Before all of those things came, we still loved him. And even in the midst of all of these things, we will still love him. I will never sell the idea of a God to a people who is just out to just give you tea and bread and that is all. No, God has an agenda. We must love him beyond the things of this world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life and everything the world can give. Because if you teach a God that only satisfies the carnal needs of people, you will produce a weak, materialistic, self-centered group of believers. But on another hand, if in a bid to balance carnality and materialism, you now sell an idea of a God who seems to be a selfish God, who is angry and will judge you. If you don't serve him, he will waste your life. You cannot call such a God love. No. I will serve a God who loved me before I even knew myself. I will serve a God who died for me before I even knew I was a sinner. Are we together? I will serve a God who has chosen to love and forgive me. I will serve a God who has made healing and health available for me. I will serve a God who has afforded me the opportunity to be free from yokes and curses and satanic things. I will serve a God who has chosen to lift and honor in ever increasing dimensions. And I will serve a God who has pleased him to place something in my hand for my needs and to be able to be a blessing to the nations. Hallelujah. This is the God that we serve. I will love him for who he is. And I will serve him in spite of these things. But because he has brought these things as benefits, consolations to my Christian experience, I will not reject them. So for those of you who have been rejecting this, our prayer point tonight 
is to look at these five areas. Which one have you rejected through religion? You must embrace everything now. There are some of you, God would have prospered you by far before now. But maybe based on your theological training, you have been... You have received the proposal of a God who does not care about your well-being. Now your children are grown, you love the Lord, but their school fees cannot be paid. Your rent is a big thorn in your flesh. You are about to tell lies, you are about to steal, whereas there is provision for you in Zion. And your life continues to misrepresent the love of this God. Anybody who learns God through the lens of your life will only see a lopsided God. For many of us, we have marketed a very selfish God. If unbelievers were to interpret their knowledge of God from the lens of our lives, it looks like God has just called us into the burdensome ministry of serving him till we die serving him with no privilege that is to us, only baiting us with some kind of thing that in heaven one day he will bless you. That's not the Jesus that we have come to show the world. In this life, there are benefits. And even in the world to come, there is an eternal reward. That even when we get to heaven, getting to heaven is not just a reward. There are crowns, there are gifts that are given to people on account of their committal and their service. Koinonia, global, the nations of the earth. For one last time before we pray, this is the end time church. The mountain of the Lord's house that was being exalted above all the nations of the earth. And in this apostolic era of the church where there's revival sweeping across the nations, I'm speaking to myself, to you as my precious people, to fellow servants, ministers of the gospel. It is important that we represent Jesus. Because there is something faulty with our presentation of Jesus. It has not been a holistic capture of who he really is. It is the reason why, according to the parable of Jesus, there are a group of people who keep rejecting Jesus. Notice from that parable, there are weak, beggarly, blind people. These are largely the groups of people who are coming to Jesus. And they are largely coming because of their needs. But the Bible is telling us, based on the instruction of Jesus, that Jesus has mandated us to go to the highways and the byways and to compel all not just blind people, all, all men, all nations, all kingdoms, all races. And we will only do that if we present a loving and forgiving Jesus, a healing Jesus, a delivering Jesus. Are we together now? A Jesus and God Almighty that lifts and honors and the one who can satisfy your mouth with good things. When they come, then we can now disciple them. The assignment of all these tools is to attract them, to bring them to the house of the Lord. The Bible says when they now come, they will say, teach us his ways. He will teach us. We will now begin to mentor them and show them other aspects of the kingdom. You don't mentor and teach a people who are afar from the Lord. The assignment of all that I've mentioned is as a, a double-edged sword of our evangelism to bring them to Jesus. When they now come, and they are planted, we can now disciple them. In my lifetime, I believe, before we see his face, we will see the manifestation of this prophetic word. God has shown me in my visions, and I stand in faith with every true man of God. We stand as a generation and even as Nigeria, God's, right now, God has placed lavish grace upon our nation. We are importing like solid minerals the gospel and a portrait of a living Christ to the nations. It has so pleased the Lord to lavishly bestow grace upon us. We must not waste that opportunity. The nations are willing to see Jesus. Kenya, we are coming. This is the Jesus we are taking to Kenya. This is the one we are taking to South Africa. This is the one we are taking to America. This is the God we are taking to Canada. This is the God we are taking to Europe. This is the God that we are bring, we reintroducing to Africans. So when you bring your idol, place him here. I place my Lord Jesus Christ. Does your idol forgive sins? Prove it. Does your idol heal the sick? Prove it. Does your idol deliver from the oppressed? From oppression? Prove it. Does your idol lift? 
Does your idol satisfy the mouth of people? Look at the quality of life of the Habalists involved in it. And you can contrast and then tell the nations, come to Jesus. And they will come sincerely. Number one, because they love him. But because they have seen through the lens of his benefits that indeed he's a good God. Ladies and gentlemen, our fathers did not fail in presenting Jesus. Some of them made mistakes and presented a lopsided God to the nations. Sincerely so, but it was a mistake. And the state of the church today in many nations is a reflection of the mistake in perspective of those who sold the idea of Jesus to them. There are nations who territorially rejected a God who lives. There are nations who territorially rejected a God who heals. They said the era of signs and wonders ended with the apostles. And many who should not die have died today. God has now brought us as sons to be respectful corrections of the mistakes of the fathers. But we must do it with humility and grace. I say it again. There is a mandate upon my life. There is a mandate upon your life. There is a mandate upon koinonia to represent the God that the nations will come to. The Bible calls him the God of Jacob. When we present this God, can I tell you, there will be no empty pews. People will come week in and week out. The thousands of people who are gathered here right to the overflows, the thousands of others who are now connecting online, they are not just coming because they like the man who is preaching. That may be wonderful. But they are coming because by the privilege of God's grace, we have made our minds with the intelligence of an artist to capture every necessary dimension that should be found in the Jesus we present to the nations. And so when you are looking for a forgiving Jesus, you will find him in Koinonia. When you are looking for a healing Jesus, you will find him in Koinonia. When you are looking for a delivering Jesus, you will find him in Koinonia. When you are looking for the lifter of men, the one who gives favor and visibility, you will find him in Koinonia. When you are looking for the one who is attentive to satisfy the hunger of people, for God's sake, you will find him in Koinonia. And if there is any other dimension we have failed to capture, may it also be found in our midst. In the name of Jesus Christ.